Hi, everyone, um, and welcome to our noon panel um, on the fourth and last day of the annual Governor's Office of Disability Affairs Conference. Um, we have a great panel um, that will be moderated by Dr. Melanie Washington, and I will turn it over to Dr. Washington to begin this session. Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending this session. And uh, welcome to the session on disability services offered at higher education institutions in Louisiana. We have seven institutions that will be represented here today. And so, um, and they'll talk to you about the services that are offered through their Office of Disability Services. <clears throat> and I know that all of the offices may be um, named something or titled something different. And so we'll get an opportunity to hear from each institution represented here today. Um, as Bambi said, my name is Melanie Washington. I am staff member in the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs. I'll be moderating this session. If anybody who is attending via Zoom or watching via uh, YouTube live, please feel free to submit your questions to any of the panelists and they will um, address those questions uh, preferably at the end, but if any panelist sees a question that they feel they want to answer as the session is going on, please feel free to answer those questions at that time. Each panelist will be given 10 minutes to talk about their respective institutions, um, and then we will move on to the next institution. So, I'm going to introduce them briefly now, and then um, if you want more information about them, their um, bios are available on our agenda. There's a link to them there, and you can read more about our fabulous panelists today. So our first panelist is Ms. Kim Bajeron, and she is from Southeastern Louisiana University. Welcome. Our next panelist is Ms. Carvette Coleman, and she is from Xavier University of Louisiana, and I think we're still waiting on her to join in. We have Mr. Tim Delaney. He's from McNeese State University. Welcome. Welcome back, because Tim has been here before. Um, we have Miss Amy King from the University of New Orleans. Welcome, Amy. Dr. Carol Landry, she's from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, welcome. Ms. Jada Netters from Southern University and A&M College, whoop, whoop, my alma mater. Welcome Jada, welcome back. Jada's been here before as well. And later on we'll have Dr. Colleen Speed from Gremlin State University um, joining us as well. So welcome um, to the panel, everyone. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And um, for the sake of uh, no confusion, I think we'll just go in the order that I just introduced you all. So we'll start with Ms. Kim Bajeron from Southeastern Louisiana University. Welcome, good afternoon. Um, as Dr. Washington said, I'm Kim Bergeron, uh, Director of Student Accessibility Services at Southeastern, uh, formerly known as Disability Services. Um, that was a name change we implemented about a year ago um, due to polling of our students, faculty, staff. Um, we thought that was more of a positive um, connotation to it than the Disability Services. Um, First thing I want to say is it's a pleasure to work in this position at our university. Um, I truly value this. This is a job um, that is so important at the university, guys, and I commend all of you, all the panelists, and for what you guys do on a daily basis. I know it's not easy. That's first of all I want to say. Uh, you too, Dr. Washington, and um, Bambi as well. Um, what we do at Southeastern is probably a similar process to what you guys do at other universities or what you may be familiar with. Our process and how it's different than um, our process that you may have 
previously been through if you were a high school student and needed disability services, okay? It's completely different in college, guys. And that's something that a lot of times students don't realize or parents don't realize. And that's something I wanna make sure to get across today, because I think that's very important. Um, but here at Southeastern, basically you have to self-identify. You have to say, you know, you have to come to our office. It's a student-driven process. It's student initiated. There's no longer a team model. So where your parent comes and maybe the instructor comes and tells us, no, you come yourself and you say, I have a disability and I would like to register with your office for accommodations. That's hard for some students. And that's why in our office too, we practice self-advocacy skills um, with various workshops and, and tips and tricks and sort of like that, because that can also be hard for a student to, to be able to self-identify, but that's crucial. You have to self-identify um, with our office. That's step one. Um, step two is we um, ask you to complete some paperwork. We have a student intake form that we ask all of our students to complete. It's basically a demographic form um, that asks you know, if you've had accommodations in the past, what were they? Where did you have them? Uh, do they work? Do they not? Um, you know, where did you go to high school in the past? Everything, anything demographic wise. Um, and then we also ask you to submit documentation of that disability. Documentation is required for us to see that you have an official diagnosis of that disability for us to be able to. Um, accommodate you. And it's a process, you know, and once again, it's student driven. Okay. Um, and that's something that I've worked really hard over the summer uh, with a lot of our parents coming in, um, you know, the transitioning fall students that have just graduated in May from high school. That's been, that's been a transition for a lot of our parents and students to learn that process and to be able to, um, understand that, you know, it's, it's totally different now. We're in college, right? So once we look at the documentation and it's good to go, basically I schedule a meeting, we have an intake meeting, and that is specifically where we talk about the accommodations plan. Um, we look to see if we think that would be something that's helpful for you, you know, um, and then we implement it. You know, and there's a couple of paperwork processes that go on after that. Um, and once again, the student's responsible for, for that too. So all along the way, it's the student's responsibility to um, carry that process out. But we're here all along the way as well. So if there's anything that comes up, any questions that they have, problems that they may run into, we're always here to, to help. Um, and it's a process that we, you know, we, we want to help. There's a need. And, you know, I tell students, you know, accommodations are not retroactive. So if you do have a disability, go ahead and register with us. Um, because once you make, you know, fail the test before, or you may fail your midterm, guess what? We can't apply the accommodations after the fact. So go ahead, register now. Um, and it's something that, you know, our office in Student Accessibility Services, we look at the whole student we know disability is part of them, but we also look at all the other aspects of them. We realize, you know, transitioning to college is difficult for all students. You know, students with disabilities is not an exception. So we try to ease that transition and educate the parents and the students on that transition um, so that they know each step of the way what's involved and what's expected. Um, so that they're kept aware and, um, you know, we do our best to communicate with them as much as we can so that they know what to expect. Okay. Uh, Ms. Ms. Bergeron, were you done? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay, good. Yes, I'm done. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, 
our questions are clear. So next, Ms. Corvette Coleman from Xavier uh, University of Louisiana has joined us. Ms. Corvette, were you ready to um, talk about your program? Yes, you can hear me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes. So basically what we have here at Xavier, we have a um, process. We begin our process with a certificate of disability. We have a website. We've um, kind of implemented some new tools and it's called Getting Started. And so um, the students actually go to the website. Um, we have all kind of educational information I laid out on the website for the students. We kind of talk about the little the process. We have a certificate of disability, which is the first beginning of the process, and they download the form. There are four different providers that we have on the form that we accept um, a completed form from, along with all of their documentation. Once all of that's actually submitted, that's reviewed by the disability committee. Um, once an approval has been granted, um, the student then is set up for an orientation, which kind of explains the process and how it actually works, um, requesting accommodations or housing accommodations. And it kind of explains all of the different options that we have on campus. And um, they actually go into a portal for the academic accommodations and they request accommodations after they've been approved each course that they want to use those accommodations in. It actually comes to this department with an electronic signature form. Everything that they've been approved for is actually keyed in. Then it goes off to the professor for review. Um, from the professor, it goes to the dean of that college. So everyone is notified um, of those accommodations that are to be applied in the classroom without revealing any type of diagnosis and the confidentiality is kept between the disability office and the actual student. For our housing accommodations, we have a separate form where the student once again um, submits that to their provider and it's submitted back to us with um, all of their medical documentation and that goes through the same process as well. And from that step, they deal directly with housing. But we put a lot of emphasis on communication. We reach, I reach out back out to the students to make sure that they are actually receiving their accommodations, that everything is smooth and that they are, um, are basically um, educated on building that rapport and keeping that communication going with the professor at all times in case anything changes or in case their needs may change. Um, so it's a lot depends on the students and you know up informing disability services about what they actually need um, and we want to make sure that we accommodate them the best way they can we can without changing the course and making sure that it is an appropriate accommodation um, and making sure that in the beginning that they actually have all of their medical documentation so that we can make sure that we implement those accommodations so the student can be successful. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Corvett. Next, we will have Mr. Tim Delaney from McNeese State University. Just want to remind the interpreters not to um, spotlight for this session. Did we lose Mr. Delaney? Tim, are you there? I'm not sure. Oh, there he is. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can hear you. Okay. Okay. I can't get the, I don't know what's going on with the camera. <laughs> okay. Um, we survived uh, two hurricanes, uh, a, a freeze and a flood. And we're still, we're still standing. 
Uh, we have a lot of great things getting ready to happen in McNeese. We started working on a new student union before this, and we're still going ahead with that. Um, one of the great ideas that have come about in the last uh, year or so is we're uh, creating an academic success center. That's going to be, it'll be comprised of our office, uh, which we're, we're now also, uh, we changed our name about a year ago too, with the Office of Accessibility Services. It'll be us, the Career Services Department, um, the tutoring, which we call the Learning Center, uh, Computer Lab, which will be open 24 hours, and the Writing Center, which is tutoring for all aspects of writing, not just for, for English. But that's going to be um, happening in the next year or two, so that's going to be really great. But our office is already relocating to that building. Um, let's talk about documentation. Uh, to register with us, you have to have proper documentation. We don't accept IEPs from the high schools. We'll look at them. Uh, we don't accept 504 plans. Most people can get documentation either from their doctor, their therapist, their specialist, you know, or, you know someone. Um, the only people that usually have problems getting the paperwork, the only students would be those that are diagnosed as learning disabled or dyslexic. We have our own tests. We do at Magnese. We will honor that IEP pending that they take that test. Uh, it's free, it doesn't cost anything once, you know, once you're a student. Uh, the only thing, the only drawback on that test is the results. You can't take that with you if you transfer. And it's only good for testing through my office. If let's say if you're going into education, you have to take the praxis exam or, or, or any uh, major board exam, you can't use those results. You'll have to actually go get tested. I always tell students, if you plan on being a teacher, then you know, start saving your money so you can get tested um, through a psychologist. But um, I, I did talk to a couple of students about a year or so ago, and I, I find that a lot of the insurances are now accepting, um, they're, they're paying for those tests. Uh, I think one student told me out of pocket, it was like $200 to get tested for a learning disability, which is really, really good, that's a good deal. Um, if you're a dual enrollment student coming out of high school, you're still half, you know, half with us, half with high school, the 504 plan would still apply. Um, some of the accommodations that we provide or extended time on tests, it's usually 50%. We do have some uh, cases where it may be uh, double time. Uh, distraction reduced testing, scribes, readers, note takers, uh, accessible classrooms, interpreters, uh, permission to record lectures. That used to be a big problem. Now it's pretty much anybody can record lectures, but I can give you permission if there is an issue with that. Um, service animal, emotional support animals go through my office. Some of the things we don't, uh, I, I get letters a lot from, um, I guess it'd be like the pediatrician, I guess. It, it, it'll be, we, we, all our paperwork has to be within three years. So it may be within the three years, but they'll have things in there that are kind of high school related, like um, unlimited time on assignments or unlimited time on tests. We don't do that at the college level. You know, there's gonna always be a time limit on things like that. We can't bump people out of classes. If you if you sign up with me late and you wanna sit in front of the classroom, I, I can't bump someone out of, their, out of their chair. So you need to register with me early. Um, our registration form for the fall will be ready in the first week of August. And you can email me. We're doing everything by email right now. It's uh, T Delaney at MacNeese. Edu, and I tell you, um, one of the things that students complained about in the past that we've, we've changed on is that we used to have all the students uh, hand deliver the letters to the instructors, and it is kind of embarrassing. You know, you have to find time to do that. And there's always the first week of school, there's always a bunch of people after the class wanting to talk to the instructors. So we're in emailing all the letters to the, to the instructors now. Um, we're also CCing the student that way you know they got it, and you don't have to do that. But I would still encourage you to introduce yourself to your teacher. That way they know who you are. You know, that makes a big difference. But I welcome you um, and hope you decide to come to Magnese, become a cowboy, and um, we're looking forward to meeting you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I, I noticed that you're the second of three who said you've changed your name from disability services or something of that sort. Um, and I think it really, speaks to being, you know, student-centered. Student um, the presenter who spoke earlier said they poll the students. And I think that's really important. Um, and it relates back to a session that we had uh, in one of the previous days of the conference where um, one of our moderators asked the panelists, do you consider yourself disabled? And so, um, you know, it really helps with empowering people to identify or not identify as disabled um, if that is what their preference is. So I just wanted to acknowledge that I think it's really important to continue to be student-centered. 
Um, and we do have a comment um, regarding that. Kyrie Waheed mentioned that accessibility department, I like that approach to assessing, um, to accessing services. What about students that are reluctant to access services because of peer pressure and confidentiality? Um, I'll, I'll save that question for uh, the end. So we'll move on to our next presenter, which is Ms. Amy King from University of New Orleans. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, to kind of touch on what Dr. Washington was just talking about, about name change, Contrary to the other schools that have spoken, we actually polled our students and our faculty and overwhelmingly the poll was to leave the name as disability services because it was a clear indicator of, of what the, the business of the office was. Now that's not to say in the future, we might not change it depending upon what our students are asking for, but for now we're still entitled disability services. As far as the procedure to register and set up accommodations, we actually approach it maybe a little bit differently some, from some other institutions, but when a student is accepted to the University of New Orleans, along with their acceptance letter, they receive a one-page document from my office. And basically that document says, congratulations on your acceptance. If you are a student with a disability, who has used accommodations in the past, we'd like you to take the opportunity to self-identify to our office so that we can discuss with you if you might need accommodations at this level of your education. That was actually a recommendation from the Office of Civil Rights um, at a presentation I attended years ago, and we implemented the process and it works very, very well. The second way we notify students about our office is that every faculty has a access statement on their syllabus. And it basically says the same thing. If you are a student with a disability who may need accommodations, please take the opportunity to set up an appointment with disability services so you can discuss this and appropriate notifications can be sent out. How the process happens is very similar then to other institutions. Students have to provide documentation, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more in just a second. And then a staff member from my office and the student have a collaborative discussion about what accommodations they've had in the past, what worked, what didn't work, and what they anticipate that they may need at this college level. And based on that collaborative discussion, we come up with a plan for accommodations. We then create a document that we call our student accommodation agreement. And that form does multiple things. It provides notice to the faculty. It provides information about how the testing accommodations specifically are gonna be implemented. And then we have both the student and the faculty sign it because we wanna make sure we're on the same page with policy procedures and rights and responsibilities. With the current pandemic situation, we've altered how we do that a little bit. We did in the past um, require or request that students meet with their faculty members during office hours, not before or after class, because there's so many people, as Mr. Delaney said, trying to talk to the instructor, but really set a time to talk with the instructor, have the form completed, and then turn it into our office. Um, I think it was Ms. Bergeron who mentioned, you know, working on self-advocacy skills. That's just one tiny step toward that process. Right now, however, for the most part, we're not doing a lot of face-to-face -face meetings, even though I've been back on campus for well over a year, almost every day, um, but we're doing a lot of things virtually by Zoom. So for the interim, especially for our new students who are new to the process, we are actually emailing out those accommodation forms to the faculty members. Um, now, as far as documentation, we don't require a three year annual review unless it's a disability that might change significantly over time. If it is, then we will ask the student to provide updates if there are any, um, you know, changes in diagnoses, additional diagnoses, or you know, different medications, something that may actually impact them 
um, in an academic setting. We will accept IEPs and 504 plans as documentation. As long as it's noted in that document, the diagnosis of the student and the student's name. It's been very interesting lately that I've received a couple of uh, IEPs that did not have the student's name anywhere in the document except for in the signature line. For other diagnoses, we will accept documentation from any appropriately licensed professional. So that professional has to be licensed to render a particular diagnosis or have an expertise or training in that area. The exception to the appropriately licensed professional is it cannot be a family member. Talking about the difference between high school and college or university, um, everybody's kind of commented on that it is pretty different. Um, the student does have to self-identify. So those IEPs or 504 plans aren't just gonna automatically come to my office. Um, so the student has to take that active role which is why we prompt the student at admissions about this. For our processes, and again, I understand that for any student transitioning from high school, where they may have been for six, four years, depending on the school, you've got a comfort level and people know you and you know the process and you know what to do. So the transition can be stressful. We will allow parents to sit in and somewhat participate in the meetings where we're discussing accommodations, but the student has to sign specific permission. We provide the student with that form. It's called a FERPA release, and FERPA stands for Family Educational Right to Privacy Act. And what that means is after the student transitions to college, their educational records become their own not the parents, even though you might be a dependent and you're still paying for everything, the student is the driver of the process and the owner of their records. We, you know, we really do this um, in a, a bunch of ways or kind of to send the subtle message. So in a lot of cases, it is the parent who may submit the documentation or they may initiate the phone call or the email with my office. So I will then just reply to the student. Um, that's frustrating for some parents because I think they're used to that kindergarten through 12 model of communication through them, but that's the indicator. And then after the student gives permission, I may copy the parent on the invitation to the meeting, but not on any other routine correspondence. If the student wants to share that with their parent, they can do that. One of the questions we were asked to touch base on is, there, are there any scholarships or funding for specifically for students who have disabilities, maybe outside of Louisiana Rehabilitation Services? And my short answer is, there is a ton of funding out there for education, but you have to do a little bit of work to find it. So what my office undertook many years ago is, when we become aware of disability specific grants or scholarships, we compile a list. That is all we have is the list of this information. I don't know the specifics. I don't know the deadlines. I don't know the amounts. But when a student asks, we gladly share that information with our students. As far as other services, we have counseling services, health services, tutoring services, a learning resource center, a writing center on campus. So we rely on them, those offices and their expertise to conduct that type of work with students. We have professional trained academic advisors in colleges and specific disciplines or programs of study under those colleges, we defer to them to do the academic advising for students, the course selection. Now that doesn't mean to say if a student comes to me and says, well, what do you know about the teaching style of Dr. Smith in history? Then I'm not gonna share what I know, um, I'm gonna share. And for some students, you know, a boring lecture, sorry, Dr. Smith, um, 
if they're just basically reading from the book and it's not very dynamic and the student has shared that you know they might have some attention issues for the class i might suggest that they look at a different section um, if that works in their schedule it might be a better fit um, I don't tell them they have to do it. I can't do that for them, but I can provide them information so they can make some informed choices. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So as far as when we had to make this kind of sudden and dramatic shift to online learning, um, I will tell you, um, even though we've had a plan for years because of hurricane season, of what we're gonna do if we have to evacuate or if the campus is shut down. So we've always had a plan that we would be able to shift to online learning. What I learned is that we really didn't have a plan or we had a plan, but faculty didn't really know what to do. So in this process, we have done trainings for faculty. We have done individual sessions with faculty. We have come up with creative tools to help in this process. And in fact, I've done training with our academic affairs and our Center for Teaching Innovation to help faculty understand how they can make their courses the most accessible. And those are, have been new collaborations over the last year, year and a half. On our campus, we have a Center for Teaching Innovation that really helps faculty in developing robust um, courses. And that includes both in-person and online courses. And they have really been our leader and our biggest advocate in providing faculty with information on how to make their courses accessible. Moving forward for the fall, we um, will again have a plan to have in-person classes, online classes, and a mixture. So some of our classes Maybe on Monday, Wednesday, you meet online and Friday you meet in person. And so we have prepared for and are ready to implement any accommodations over all of those different formats. And our faculty um, took a little bit of time, it took a learning curve for sure, but our faculty are all on board with all of the different possibilities and options that we have to best serve our students so that they can be successful in their courses. Thank you so much, Ms. King. You um, did a great job outlining every question. And so that was very informative. Um, one of our attendees commented that I would recommend that you send this portion of the conference of, our, uh, of YouTube or Zoom meeting to every high school or parent of disabled students and disabled departments uh, in Louisiana. It's great information. And it led me to a question that I wrote down is that do you ever get, um, you know, how do you, some of you have touched on this, but how do you get the resources out? I know, uh, Amy, you mentioned that. Um, I think you all do it at admissions, but um, you know, working in higher ed, I, I'm a social worker and I also teach in social work. And we often, I often run into students who say, oh, I didn't, I didn't realize I can get accommodations. So what are some of the ways that you um, get the information out to students and parents? I'll take that, Dr. Washington. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, we, in every course syllabi, um, we have an actual um, statement, okay? So every teacher in their syllabi has a statement about our office and what we provide. We are also very visible on campus. Um, any type of resource fairs or events that there's any tabling on campus in our main student union, we're always a part of. Um, you know, I want us, I want our office to be a resource to the students and not something that's embarrassing to them or something that they're afraid to come to. Um, you know, so anytime I have an opportunity to, to welcome students to our office and to present to students that we're a resource to help them um, and, you know, to do the best we can to help them, that, that's what I try to do. So we're in our Lions, um, 
newspaper, we're in, <laughs> we're everywhere. I try to put us everywhere I can so that students know we're available and um, to come see us, that we're, we're, we wanna help them. Very good. And we actually, if I could interject real quick, we actually, or my office, I've been with the office since 1996. Um, so I've seen some kind of twists and turns and changes to how things work. When I first started with the office, we were regularly invited to meetings, conferences, um, different things with college counselors that were at high schools so that we could explain all this to the college counselor and hopefully that information would disseminate down to the students. Um, that probably stopped 10, 15 years ago. So if there are any high school counselors, um, college counselors on this call, I would actually encourage you, if you have a professional organization or if you have any of these types of meetings, to perhaps start inviting um, disability services providers to some of these meetings so everybody's on the same page. Um, and I used to be invited to IEP and 504 planning meetings at the end of the student's career in high school. I haven't gotten one of those invitations in years either. We do present at our open houses. So when prospective students are coming, you know, we're there. And I think um, Ms. Bergeron said that same thing. You know, we're there to kind of say, okay, don't forget if you've used accommodations, like you can still do this in college. So that's another way we try to get ahead of everything so that when students hit the ground running in their courses, they're ready and set up with their accommodations. Okay, good. Thank you so much for, uh, for um, including that information. So now we'll move to Dr. Carol Landry from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I am Dr. Landry with um, the Office of Disability Services at UL Lafayette. Um, like Amy, um, we've recently considered a name change as well, but our students um, have not really been pushing for that. Um, it's something we would definitely consider in the future. But um, here at UL Lafayette, um, like everyone else, we're, we're charged with providing equal access to students with disabilities for all of our programs, services, buildings, so forth and so on. Um, the process for registering with our office is basically the same as everyone else, except ours is more automated. So about two to three years ago, um, we kind of had to move from the traditional paper file um, system to an automated system. And we use a company called AIM, Accessible Information Management. Um, we purchased this program and it's been absolutely wonderful for our office in terms of office management, but also for our students. So um, basically what the student initiates the accommodation process through their AIM portal, which they can access either through our webpage or through ULink, which is the student information portal. The student goes in, fills out the online application. They can attach, they can upload their documentation directly into that application. Um, it gets sent over to our office. The student gets an automatic email telling them what the next step is gonna be in the process. Once we have reviewed the application and we reviewed the documentation, the student gets an email with an invitation for them to schedule um, their accommodation meeting. And so like most offices, um, the, the whole registration process is basically two parts. The first is the student initiating the request um, and us reviewing the documentation. And then the second part, which is really the most important, we have a meeting um, with each student where we discuss reasonable and appropriate accommodations um, for them at the university level. And it's not really based necessarily on diagnosis. It's just more of functional limitations. You know, how does your disability impact you in the educational environment? So there's no really cookie cutter set of accommodations that kind of go with a disability. It's very individualized. We could have 25 people in one room who all have the same diagnosis, but they all might need something a little bit different because you know, we're all different people. So 
um, once the accommodation meeting is completed, um, the student um, can then automatically send their accommodation letter to each of their faculty members. So that is done by email. Um, the faculty member receives the accommodation letter, which only states that the student is registered with our office and what their approved accommodations are. If any faculty member feels like one of the accommodations might kind of compromise the one of the core essential functions of their class, then they can call us and then we'll talk about it and try to work, you know, work something out. Um, our most commonly approved accommodation, I think Tim might have touched on this, is um, extended testing time. And that, as most of you know, is one of those accommodations that just kind of transcends multiple disabilities. You know, so I could have a student with a learning disability who needs more time to take their exams because of the processing time. Um, individuals with physical disabilities just may simply need more time to just kind of manipulate the testing environment. Individuals with ADD um, may need more time because they zone out during exams and so forth and so on. So for that reason, we do have a testing center in our office where we will administer exams um, with extended time or whatever other exam accommodations are needed. Um, and that's kind of as a way of helping out the faculty because not all of them have the resources or the ability to, to provide the students with testing accommodations. So we have a testing center here in our office where students can come to take their exams and we provide the accommodations. So we monitor the time um, if they need um, in a reader or you know, any, other, any other resource while they're taking their exam, we can provide that here for them. Um, gosh, everyone else just really kind of touched on the, on the overarching features of, of what we do here. But um, I think one of the things that we take the most pride in here at our office is that um, while we do promote um, self-advocacy and, and we kind of coach our students on how to do that, we serve as a mediator between the student and the faculty member if the student has, you know, just kind of reached an impasse in, in their attempts to resolve an issue. Um, they'll come to us and we'll step in and serve as the mediator and, and try to work out an accommodation issue that, that everyone can agree with and is, and is fair and reasonable. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to touch on at this moment. COVID, you know, um, like, like everyone else, we had to pivot quickly. And um, in terms of some, some changes that we might be keeping, uh, you know, we had to conduct all of our accommodation meetings remotely during COVID. And we're finding that students really like that. So that is an option for them. Um, we can, we can um, from this point forward, do accommodation meetings face-to-face, -face, socially distanced, masked, you know, following all of our, our guidelines. But we're going to keep that in place because students really kind of seem to like that option to have their accommodation meetings done remotely. Um, so that's one of the changes I think that we'll probably keep in place moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Landry. And so I have a follow up question to a few of the comments that you made about um, specifically you all serving as the mediator between students and faculty. So in my experience in teaching, we do get, you know, letters from the students that talk about, you know, their accommodations. And sometimes I guess it can be confusing about how, you know, far that accommodation extends. So for instance, I had a student who, um, she, she was allot allotted extra time on test. And so I guess just in my ignorance, although I am a social worker, um, she would send me emails to say, okay, um, the assignment that's due on Monday, I'll turn it in on Tuesday. I'll turn it in on Wednesday. <laughs> and so um, I found myself as it happened more and more, I was like, let me contact the Office of Disability Affairs to find out if this is you know, accurate, if this is how the accommodations are supposed to work. And so my question is, um, do faculty members have the freedom to contact disability services regarding a student's accommodation plan? And if so, is there something that has to take place for us to communicate freely? 
oh no, we encourage faculty communication. It is always in, in the student's best interest. Um, so we it, it's on our accommodation letter, first of all, there's, there's kind of a blurb at the bottom of our accommodation letter that encourages faculty to reach out to us if they have a question about a particular accommodation that the student has been approved for. Um, you know, it's taken years, but we have really worked hard to build a, a, a really good um, relationship with many of the faculty on, on our campus. And so I'm finding that they're not afraid at all to reach out and to call us. Um, we welcome that, we encourage that because it is confusing. Um, and a lot of times for our new faculty coming in, they get this letter and they're like, okay, what is this? What do I have to do? And, and we find sometimes that faculty, a lot of times are really kind of afraid to do the wrong thing. So we get a lot of those phone calls as well. Um, I got this letter, I'm not quite sure about it. I don't wanna mess up. I know, I know this, is a, this is a law. Um, I wanna do what's best for the students. So, you know, let's, let's talk about that. We, all, we always encourage faculty to do that. And I'm, I'm fairly confident that my colleagues here on this call do the same. Yes, absolutely. And I got really um, good feedback from uh, the institution that I worked for from the Office of Disability Services. And I was just, you know, wondering if that happens across the board so other people can know that that's okay to do. So, Dr. Washington, if you wouldn't mind if I could jump in. Um, we also uh, actually participate in the new faculty orientations. Okay. Each semester. So when the new faculty join Southeastern, um, we have faculty orientations every semester. So we always make sure to have a part in that as well to, to orient the new faculty to our office and the accommodations we provide and how those accommodations may look in their classroom. So they say that's helpful to them. Wonderful. And I see that Amy said that they do the same thing. Mm -hmm. so that's good. Okay, so um, we have a few questions coming in the chat, but we still have two more institutions. So we will move on to Ms. Jada Netters from Southern University and a and College. Good morning, can you all hear me? Uh-oh, Yes, ma'am, we can hear you and see you now. Okay, I am Ms. Netters with Southern University and I am the coordinator for the Office of Disability Services for the Baton Rouge campus. I, um, like so many of my other colleagues that spoke before me, our processes are similar but somewhat different um, in terms of students being able to register here with our office. I would probably say my process is more similar to um, ULL in that our students are now able to go through our websites and register uh, complete their application, tell us a little bit about their um, disability or their medical condition and what accommodations they are seeking. And so once that information is sent over to us, then we do send them a welcome letter or a letter of invite so that we can schedule a Zoom meeting with them to further talk about how we can assist them and how the accommodations can assist them in the classroom setting. Um, once that process is done and that meeting is scheduled, then we do offer uh, an approval letter just to say that they have been approved for accommodation services here at Southern University. And we send them their accommodation letter by email. We send it directly first to the student. Once the student reads over it to ensure that all the accommodations we discussed in our meeting are there, if they have any other questions or wanna add an accommodation or discuss any other, other accommodations, it is due at that time. Once we have um, done that, I uh, then the student signs their letter of accommodation. When they return their signed letter of accommodations to us, then I forward the letter of accommodations to their uh, faculty members that are listed on their class schedule for that current semester. The faculty members receive it by email, they review it, they sign it, they send it back to the office acknowledging that they have received the letter of accommodation and they understand the accommodations. As ULL stated, we do have a statement on the bottom of the accommodation letters that tell professors if they have any questions or feel like the accommodations are 
impacting the integrity of the course, they can always contact the Office of Disability Services. We can discuss it and have a discussion with the student as well so that we are all on the same page in terms of accommodations being implemented correctly. Our most um, awarded accommodation as other universities is extended time. Extended time on tests. That's what we usually have the most um, accommodations for. In terms of other processes here at the office, we do now have a welcome letter that will be included with our students for um, through enrollment services when they are accepted to the university. And that letter will just tell them simply the process to register with the Office of Disability Services if they are seeking accommodation services, um, what type of accommodations we normally cover. And I put them in five categories. So I do learning disabilities, uh, medical disabilities, physical disabilities, mental health disabilities, and then I do sensory impairments. So they can kind of know those are the, the categories that we cover, but we don't limit the number of disabilities or the type of disabilities that we cover. So we do put them in categories. Um, the other thing that we do to allow students to know more information about our office here on campus is we have a statement on every course syllabus that uh, is a generic statement that's sent out to the faculty that they can include on their course syllabus. Um, if they're using the Moodle platform and they're using the concourse syllabus here on Southern University's campus, that statement is automatically included on the student on the course syllabus for students to see. Um, some of the other ways that we are distributing information about our services here on campus, I have attended some high school career fairs um, within the East Baton Rouge Parish. And um, I've also attended them in person virtually as well. We also attend student orientation for incoming freshmen here on campus. And just last semester, I have created social media accounts through Twitter and Instagram, um, because that seems to be the two popular social media platforms here on our campus that students use so that they can have that information or be able to access that information. Since creating those social media accounts, I believe my current followers right now sit at a thousand and that's just within a semester's time. So I do have a, a student worker that assists me with posting the content, making sure that we make two or three posts every week regarding um, disability services, the type of services we offer and the other services that are available to students here on campus. And so, um, our other services include our counseling center, and we also have a center for student success where students can receive tutoring for uh, their academic Yay. courses. And so one of the things I can tell you, uh, I got to go. One of the things I can tell you with our center for student success is our tutors are being trained to assist students with disability services, whether it's teaching them, you know, better note taking skills, um, understanding how students with learning disabilities learn differently from other students with non, um, with no disabilities rather. So we are making sure that people in our support community are trained to assist our students with disabilities as well. Um, in terms of faculty notification or faculty understanding, we do present at our faculty convocation and coming up this fall semester, I will be doing a four part training series for faculty so they can understand accommodations, they can understand the federal laws and what it entails and what it looks like for them. The only other thing that I can add that um, we are also covering in terms of FERPA, we have a lot of situations where parents do want to take the lead and be the person to fill out the paperwork or refer the student for services and I have to tell them, you know, the process is a little different from pre K 12 to the collegiate level, your student has to be the one to come and self identify to self disclose to complete the paperwork. It's been a lot of times where I've had students to come in and they will ask about the process and they'll say, well, my mama sent me, but I don't really know why she sent me. And so when I go, well, do you did you receive accommodations in high school? They go, yes, I did. Can you tell me why did you receive those accommodations? What did they look like? So I can kind of get them on the right track. Well, a lot of the times the students cannot answer why they receive accommodations. And so teaching them to be self-advocate 
for themselves is one of my big goals here at the university so that students can know what to ask for, what accommodations they actually need, what's effective for them, and then what should they be doing moving forward. Um, I think I kind of touched on everything that I was asked. If you have any questions, by all means, please let me know. Yes, you did a great job, um, Jada. And I, I just wanted to um, pull out the point that the tutors are being trained um, to tutor students with disabilities. I think that is amazing. Um, and I'm wondering, is it like all tutors or do y'all have like a subsection of tutors who are trained especially to do that? Um, as of right now, my goal is to start with 10 tutors uh, that are going to be working in the Center for Student Success with some of them coming from the areas of psychology and rehab counseling, um, just because they have the background and understand a little bit about disabilities. But eventually I want to have anybody that works in Center for Student Success trained to assist students with disabilities. Absolutely, they all should attend that training. <laughs> Um, and so Dr. And Dr. Washington, this is Bambi. Can I ask a question of Ms. Netters? You had mentioned about the, um, putting the, the students into categories, but I, I didn't get or didn't uh, understand like what is the purpose of that? Is that um, you know they get so you have specialized um, staff that, that understands those type of disabilities better or can you explain that a little bit more? Um, I'm, I kind of think forward. Um, I'm a little different from most of my colleagues here on the campus. And so the reasoning for my categories is so that when we are able to hire new staff into the office, I can say, do you have this training to work with students with learning disability that can better assist my students on campus who fall in that category? So rather it's a learning disability for dyslexia, math, reading, um, or an intellectual disability, I want somebody who knows those categories and knows those accommodations very well to be able to assist those students, that population of students within our office. Okay, that's what I thought, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Netters. And last but not least, we have Dr. Colleen Speed from Gramlin State University. Welcome, Dr. Speed. I know you signed in a little bit later. Uh, can you, okay, good job. Yes, I, I actually didn't. I actually, maybe two minutes later, I guess so. But anyway, never mind. <laughs> so everybody. I well, know that you were transitioning from another meeting at 12 o'clock. <laughs> I did, I did. But I was, I got a chance to um, kind of get in on all the good stuff. You all have so many uh, uh, good things that you're doing. And basically we are pretty much doing the same thing with our process. Uh, the students do self-identify by clicking on a link they request. They'll send a, a request to, um, to our center. And after um, they send the request, then they'll get a letter for a meeting. And then with that meeting, we discuss um, what's needed. And what would be needed from them is a diagnosis three years or less from a physician, uh, a licensed therapist or or also or a, a psychiatrist or any medical um, professional. And after we get that, we process their um, information, approve their, and most of the time, if they self-identify, there's no disapproval unless there's some, no one, they don't get, they don't have their documentation. So. What we do is we look at that process, we get the process done uh, for us there, that paperwork. Uh, the student is basically everything right now, after COVID, we do everything online um, through Zoom. We'll have Zoom meetings. Uh, we, do, we process their paperwork uh, via DocuSign. I did look at Ames and I worked with Georgia Tech for quite some time with their program. So we do a lot of virtual books for the students, for the resources. And for the faculty, uh, we do a training for their faculty training that they're required to go to every year. So we'll do the faculty training and go through just uh, the accommodations, what's expected mm -hmm. of the student 
and um, giving them power for their class, but as also making them understand that the student um, who have accommodations, um, who has accommodation, they need to um, speak to us. Speak to us if they have any problems. Uh, as it relates to campus living, uh, students will request accommodations through uh, accessibility um, services. And we did change our name and we're in the process of changing it again um, because, you know, I read an article uh, that one of the universities changed their name because disability actually means broken. And so we don't want uh, that to be our, um, our voice for them. But at the same time, I like the fact that if you say disability service, everybody knows that it's disability service office and there's no confusion. So uh, I think we both have points in regards to um, the name. Also, um, like I said, campus living, they requested through campus living, but then they will come through our off, they request a, a campus living accommodations through our office, but then of course we will, uh, send it to the campus living office. Food services, the same thing uh, with IT, IT for any accessibility tools, um, any technology that's needed for the students in the classroom, we will go through uh, uh, IT for that um, concern. The most requested uh, accommodations for us is through campus living, Right now we have an upsurge for emotional support services, uh, which is um, quite interesting. I'm sure you all can agree to that. Uh, with the emotional support services, they request it initially through residential living, campus living, and then campus living will direct them through us and they will start the initial process and um, identifying their um, diagnosis. And then from there, uh, it has to be 30 days prior to coming to campus. If you bring an uh, animal on campus prior to, uh, I mean, without, go, if it's after the 30 days and you, um, students um, either are fine or they won't, they can't keep the animal. Uh, let's see what else I'm trying to not, be so redundant because basically we're doing the same thing. Mm. Oh, yes. And then on, one of the other commonly used, uh, of course, like I said, extended time on testing, homework. Um, also, they look, the students also suggest for those, for some students, they want to test in separate room. So since we had uh, our uh, online coursework, uh, we haven't had to, you know, have a separate classroom. But in in face to face, we do have a testing. Uh, 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 we have uh, we have a place in uh, we have resources in University College where the students can receive um, tutoring for any class. Uh, student can receive uh, they can receive uh, ret what the retention office they actually help those students who may not feel like they're confident or if a student is just needing direction uh, we help them with that uh, as it relates to just adjusting to uh, the freshman life and so that's what the university college is for and we also offer our counseling services which our counseling services slash disability services is in in conjunction with one another and so we don't push counseling on students who are requesting uh any accommodation or any uh accessibility services but we do let them know that we are here to help them so with that being said if there are any questions comments anything that i can maybe add to let me know Thank you so much, Dr. Speed. Um, I have uh, one or two follow-up questions. The first is you said that you guys will be changing your name again. So you changed to uh, accessibility services. Are you changing back to disability services? No, actually, um, I like the access um, 
name. And so we're changing to accessibility, um, campus community and equitable support services. So, and it's, and then the word is access and it's pretty long, but um, I think things should be equitable to the students. I think they should have clear uh, access to the campus, whether it's activities, whether it's food, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's campus living. I believe that the support should be where the student uh, has in no way feel broken, but actually feel like their, their name makes a difference because I do believe that the name makes a difference in everything we do, whether it's our name or whether it's a name of a um, department. So that's my voice. That's my punctuation on that. It's not, it's not set in stone. Also want to say that, um, I don't know if you are all are part of a head association on higher education and disability. It's, um, it's a national association. It's been very helpful uh, to me. And um, there are lots of resources on that in that organization, lots of articles, uh, our Office of Civil Rights are there to support us. So if you have not joined AHEAD, uh, I, I'm, I want to let, to let you know, not only is AHEAD um, focus on uh, accessibility accommodations um, for the campus, but it actually uh, institute uh, trainings for IT, for faculty, for the president, vice presidents. It's a huge organization that is amazing. Uh, many of my resources that I have uh, implemented here at Grambling State University, I've um, actually learn from my colleagues that I have um, gained the relationships with AHEAD and just uh, just being able to call or look on the website or being on the listserv just asking a question, hey, do you all know anything about this? Or have you heard this? Do you have a letter for this? And one of the, um, I think one of the most amazing um, resources is that we are very clear to say, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Here, let me give you this. So, uh, yes, I have had a busy day, but I do appreciate uh, everything that you all have said. It has been a huge blessing. I took many notes from you all. I didn't take for granted that we're all saying mostly the same thing, and I'll probably be giving some of you some calls. So thank you so much for your information. Great, this was twofold then. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So, Dr. Speed, you mentioned, I think I heard you mention, mention something about service animals. Oh, yes. Okay. So we have the service animal and we have emotional support animal. Now, the service animal, they do not need uh, an approval because they have already been approved. <laughs> but the emotional support animal is a new, um, I don't want to say it's a trend, but it, it has almost become a trend for many of the students. And, it, and so um, some of the students don't even have disabilities uh, letters, but somehow they come up with them. And, and we have to, and I'm not uh, minimizing anybody's uh, conditions or uh, diagnosis, but we've had to uh, readjust and actually uh, come up with policies and work together with AHEAD and with other colleagues to say, how do we handle the emotional support animals on campus? And so with that, uh, if you all need policies, if you're looking for something or if you have questions about it, uh, let me know because uh, emotional supports animal may come with many different, um, I guess, a variety. And so with that, you have to have policies and you have to have something in place that it doesn't become something that you have a form on your campus. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing now, working with the emotional support animal, um, piece on the disability services. So that's it, what, that's huge right now. And so, yes, I wanted to kind of go around the panel and just kind of, if you all can give me a brief, I guess like a, a real quick explanation of how you all deal with that, if you do, if you deal with it. Okay, so let's start with uh, Dr. Carol Landry, first on my screen. Okay. Hi, um, yes, uh, about 
two or three years ago, the university adopted an all animal policy, which can be found on our website that it, you know anyone has access to. But that animal policy addresses service animals, emotional support animals, and pets. And it applies to um, the entire university community and visitors. So it's, it's a very over, um, overarching policy. But the way we handle emotional support animal requests is that they are all funneled through housing because um, emotional support animals are kind of a, a, a function of the Fair Housing Act. So um, the requests kind of go through housing and they are disseminated to a committee. Um, so we formed a committee to evaluate emotional support animal requests. Um, the committee is pretty robust. So we have someone from our campus safety team on that committee. We have housing, we have Red Li Res Life, we have um, mental health counselors um, and disability services on, on the committee. So we all get together as a team to evaluate the, the request. We do have a couple of um, deadlines. July 1st is the deadline for the fall semester. Um, and so a student's packet has to be complete and ready to go so that we can have our meeting as soon after July 1st as possible so that students can be informed of the, of the decisions prior to coming to campus for the fall semester. So um, we've done this now for a few years. It seems to be working pretty well. Um, prior to formalizing it, having a policy, coming up with a committee, I was getting just inundated with requests, three, four, five, six, seven requests a week. It, it was really becoming overwhelming. And, and when this first started several years ago, I was the only person who was, who was you know, kind of evaluating these requests. And so um, that kind of precipitated the need for us to get a team of experts to, to take a look at it. So that's how we do it. At UL. Thank you so much, Dr. Ranger. Um, Ms. King. Um, so, similar to um, I think probably everybody else, we do have some specific documentation guidelines for emotional support animals. Um, what I find is a lot of the documentation submitted doesn't meet those guidelines. So, then we have to have a conversation with the student about the specific criteria. Um, we have collaborated with other institutions. Um, and some who have actually gone through an Office of Civil Rights review so that the, the, the information we're putting out is kind of the, the most current. Um, and we revise it every year. We look at other policies. We consult with other professionals um, for emotional support animals. It's a collaborative decision between my office and housing um, on all housing, almost all housing related accommodations. Um, the, the request will first be submitted to our res life um, and that's on the student's application. We inform students that the process could take up to 30 days for approval, but just like any request for accommodation, we don't set any hard and fast deadlines. Um, so, you know, the student is advised that they cannot bring the animal until it is approved as an accommodation, but it actually can take place at almost any point during um, a semester, as long as the documentation meets the, the standard guidelines. For service animals, they are not required to, students are not required to register with our office. Um, many do because they're just, with their disability, they may need some other accommodations, but there is no requirement um, that students do that. And I do provide lots of advisement throughout the semester to faculty, staff, and students who do have questions about students who have animals on campus and what's allowed, what isn't, what animal can go where, and those kind of things. So it's a constant conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. All right, Kimberly. Yes, I would like to echo both um, because we too, at Southeastern, um, we have a committee that we put together um, when we receive requests. It's myself, um, our counseling center director, it's also the housing um, assistant director and um, another housing member as well. And we also, part of that documentation is not only uh, documenting there's a disability, but we also require vaccination records on that animal. So, uh, you know, it's cat, dog, whatever. Um, we've had approved some animals that, um, like a rabbit, for instance, that hasn't been vaccinated or can't be vaccinated in Louisiana. So that's a little different. But um, so we, we do really look at the documentation and go through it from there. And one key difference, too, with an ESA versus a service animal 
is that with an ESA, that animal is only allowed in the residence hall, like in that person's room. It's not allowed to roam campus, to go to campus dining, to go to the bookstore, to go wherever, like a service animal is allowed. Um, so that's something that um, Ms. King was it hit it on the head actually, because we, we have a lot of conversations with faculty because there's, there's stark differences between the two. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of people don't know the difference. Um, so yeah, we get a lot of conversation about that, those two. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, Ms. Coleman. Yes, we as well, we have documentation that is required for service animals and um, support animals. There is a difference, like she just said, I wanna piggyback off of that. Um, a lot of times, like she said, people don't know the difference and we have to actually explain to them what the difference is. And we also require documentation um, to, for, on the student as well, because we wanna know why you actually need that support animal. Um, that makes a difference because otherwise everybody would say, I need a pet. Um, so we wanna make sure, and we have clear cut documentation um, you know, from their physician, you know, how is this going to help you and what's the reason for you needing it? Um, we require the documentation on the pet, the vaccination records. We also require a picture. Um, a lot of times they'll tell you over the phone, I want to bring such and such dog. Well, we need to know what type of dog it is, how big that dog is, because in a dorm, we want to make sure it's going to be size appropriate. Um, for the dorm itself. And we wanna make sure that, you know, we get the documentation in on time because we have to find a roommate that's gonna be okay with that dog. Um, a lot of, you know, it's very tough sometimes to try to find roommates that wanna live with someone else. So there's a lot that goes into that. We do have a committee um, with disability services, our health department staff and our counseling center. We all work together as one unit and housing as well. Um, a lot of times we let housing give us a little bit more feedback because they're the ones that are used to those pets being in there. They'll say, hey, you can't have that type of dog. That dog's going to bark all night or that particular type of cat is not appropriate. So um, we truly, truly work together as a team um, to make sure that that process is smooth and to make sure that the student receives enough education as well on what animals we will accept and which animals we cannot accept. Okay, thank you. I don't know why I just, it popped in my head like our students allowed to have snakes, but hopefully not. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> but uh, Ms. Netters. Uh oh, okay. Um, here at Southern University, we have just created a housing accommodation committee where the Office of Disability Services will serve on that committee as well as uh, the director of the counseling center, the director of the housing. And then we have two um, individuals from the student affairs office that will also serve on the committee so that we can address the issue of emotional support animals being on the campus of Southern University. Um, one of the things I can say is we've had some situations on campus where um, individuals have brought a pit bull and a rock wallow and they were in a dormitory and we did not know. And so they kind of snuck their animal in and hold on one moment, Azaria, you have to get her, please. Um, so they, they, stuck, they snuck their animal into the campus and we did not know it. And so once the uh, office became aware of it, we had them to bring vaccination records of the animals so that we can make sure that they have a vac vaccinations and that they're being followed by a licensed uh, veterinarian. The other thing that we are doing now as a part of the committee is to make sure that we have deadlines in place so that students who need these animals can um, apply for it ahead of the fall semester or the spring semester or the summer session if they're going to be living on campus. Um, so that is something we are working towards and coming up with and guidelines and policy revisions are happening in terms of emotional support animals. Just like every other campus, we do not deny a service animal because we can't. It's covered under ADA. That is their legal right to have it. We do have to have conversations with our faculty members so that they can ensure that 
they understand the difference between the service animals as well as the ESA animals. Um, sometimes students will um, say that they're going to bring one type of animal and we've had a situation where we had a snake on campus that got out. So it actually caused another student to now have issues with anxiety and wondering if something is going to be crawling through their vents. So that is something that we have to prepare for in the future. And so we're working towards that. It is something that wasn't addressed here heavily on campus, but I am trying to make sure that we cover all bases because I do interact with other schools and you know we talk about civil rights cases and how things are being handled and so i try to ensure that we have policies and procedures that we can follow so that both the student can be satisfied but we are also protecting the liability of the campus so i hope that answers your question yes thank you so much so we're going to take tim um to answer it and then we'll try to get at least two questions in from the audience mm -hmm. before we um end Okay, um, I am the the committee. One only, I'm the only person on the committee. Um, if you have an emotional support animal, you have to register at the beginning of every semester. Well, actually, just the fall semester. But if you use our services every semester, and the uh, service animals is pretty much up to them. Uh, our main concerns is uh, the fake paperwork that goes around. Uh, if it's not local, we don't take it. You know, it has to be uh, Louisiana. It has to be preferably. If you're living in Lake Charles, why are you getting paperwork way up in Arkansas, Shreveport, Oregon, wherever, you know? So we want it local, something we can verify. And a lot of them will come with this paperwork. The guy's out of Oregon, but he's certified in Louisiana. We're not going to take it. It has to be local. Um, and it, it, if I, I explained to them, they end up paying more money buying that paperwork. If they go see a therapist, it would cost them probably about half what they're paying for the, for the paperwork. But we do, we've had a few like that. But most of them follow the rules. Uh, once um, I look at their paperwork, I verify it, I send a letter to housing, they have to go meet with housing, make an appointment with the dean of uh, student services and housing, and they go over the rules, basically about cleaning up after their animal, and they're also not allowed to, you know, the animal can, stays in the dorms, it's not allowed in the cafeteria, anywhere else, I mean, you know, he goes outside to go to the bathroom with the dog or whatever, they have to clean up after him, but um, other than that, it's just, you know, we have probably 12 animals, mostly dogs, uh, well, actually, I think, Dogs and cats about 50-50, but we do have some um, guinea pigs too. Yeah, and that's, that's about it. <laughs> no snakes. No. <laughs> okay, good. I'm saying good. I don't know. Maybe there's a need for that. All right. Yeah. So now we're we'll take the uh, first question that was um, submitted in Zoom, and that is, what about students that are reluctant to access services because of peer pressure and confidentiality? We'll take like whoever wants to jump on that. And some of you may have already addressed it. Amy, you want to go? I'll jump in. I'm not quite sure what the, the peer pressure is, but I can tell you what a lot of students explain to me, especially in using testing accommodations. The question I get a lot is, well, what is the rest of the class going to think? If I'm taking my test in your testing center and I'm not there on the day of the test, my kind of brutally honest answer is think about how you feel on the day of a test. And you are so focused and so anxious in most cases about taking that test that I don't think other students are going to notice like, you know, that guy that carries the blue backpack isn't in class today, you know, and I can only speak from my own experience and I tell students that. When I'm showing up for a test, I'm like, oh, good God, please make sure that everything I just crammed into my head is able to be recalled. So I'm so hyper focused that I don't think other students are going to notice. Um, so if that's kind of what they were intending about peer pressure, you know, that's that's my story. Um, and students seem to go, oh, that makes sense. Um, as far as confidentiality, when the student um, and myself or our coordinator meet, we have them fill out an exchange of information form, which basically is a waiver that if they are okay with us sharing anything about their disability, and we list some very specific parties on campus, that they can fill that out and allow us to. If they don't give us permission, and I would say 75% of our students don't give us permission, and that's okay, because we're still gonna coordinate the accommodations, we can't share anything about their disability with those parties. We can talk about their accommodations, what that looks like, those kind of things, but never specifics. 
I also tell students, even if they give me permission, most of the time my conversation with their faculty member is going to be about accommodations and how those work. The faculty members, if they're contacting me, really aren't like, oh, I want to know what's going on. They want to know like what this means, what this process is. Oh my gosh, how am I going to do these accommodations type conversations and not really to get at information. In the tenure that I've had at the University of New Orleans, there have been two times that we have shared the actual diagnosis with the student and the faculty and we were all in a meeting together. And that was really, I felt, and I explained to the student before we met with the faculty member, the only way that I could get the faculty member to understand why we were implementing some of these specific uh, accommodations and the student was completely fine with us sharing that information. Thank you. I think Dr. Colleen Speed had her hand up. When you said peer pressure, or when someone spoke about peer pressure, uh, and I was, as she said, I was looking at if a student uh, was going to class and she had to hand out her um, accommodations to someone else, it would also um, make them feel like their peers are seeing them, you know, handing their paperwork. If that's what if that's what we're still doing, or if um, they're with friends um, that maybe even have accommodations and are just feeling like I can't tell anyone that I, you know, I can, I, maybe I need to know about accommodations, but I don't know how to ask or I don't know where to go. So I'm not sure, as she said, it could be a, uh, a, a, you know, several reasons why peer pressure um, for students, for students with um, a diagnosis, I'm not sure. But that's, that's, that's what I was thinking as well. It's just that, you know, students sometimes may feel pressured by their peers just to have to even figure out what to do to get their, the, the accommodations that they're needing. I'm not sure either, so. Thank you, Dr. Speed. And so we have a couple of comments here and you all can probably read those. They're a little bit lengthy and we're running out of time. So um, I'll go to the second question. Who handles physical versus academic modifications at your school? Whoever wants to answer that. Physical versus academic accommodations. I'm not um, sure. So the, the physical. Oh, I'm sorry, somebody else is speaking. I'm just saying, I, you know, for physical and uh, academics, you know, the physical, if there's a physical um, issue, we handle it out of our office. But if it's something with athletics, maybe if they had an injury and they need uh, temporary accommodations, our office will handle any physical issues. Uh, if the student has been hurt, you know, uh, playing in a baseball game, you know, and if it's, if it's life changing for that moment, we do offer those accommodations temporarily. And I think Kim wanted to answer that as well. Yes, I wanna um, go back real quick to the confidentiality part because that is a very, very common question that I'm asked by students because they do worry about that. Um, they, they do worry about how they come across to their uh, peers. Um, you know, absolutely what Ms. King said, you know, what are they going to think if I'm not in for the class or what are they going to think if they if they see somebody giving me notes or what are they going to think if, if I'm a few minutes late coming to class every day, what's going to happen. Um, we do in terms of confidentiality, if it's a safety health issue for the student, for instance, if it's a seizure related issue, or if the student um, you know, tends to pass out in classes, that sort of thing, then that professor knows, okay? So that is the only time um, that that professor is gonna know of that disability. Um, and one thing I do wanna say is we've all mentioned the student accommodation letter that the student receives, that never lists the student's disability, that only lists the accommodations um, and that's what the faculty receives, okay? So that's never listed on there, just the accommodations. That's another question I get all the time too. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think we have one minute left, but Amy, I'll go ahead and let you, I see your hand is raised. Sure, as far as like physical accommodations, meaning like the physical 
um, accessibility of campus, most of those requests, if there's an issue, will come first to me. But I obviously don't have the ability to, you know, build a ramp or things like that. That is beyond my skill set. So I work very collaboratively um, with our director of facilities. Um, in fact, we both have each other's cell phone and make some frequent calls. And we actually have on our disability services page on the front of it, a barriers to access reporting form. So students can report that. And sometimes, quite frankly, it's another student has parked their bicycle and chained it onto the um, accessible ramp into a building. So we get phone calls, we get emails, and that goes to both me and the director of facilities. And we address those as immediately as possible. Things like when elevators go out and students have classrooms on the second floor, we actually get the notice from our facilities department as soon as an elevator goes out. We have very standard language that has to be posted on the elevator. And then we keep a list of our students that need elevator access in order to get to class. And that generates us to email their faculty and say, hey, you know, Johnny Smith isn't gonna be in class today because he can't get there. Um, and we ask that the faculty um, record the lecture and touch base with the student. Thank you so much. This is such a rich conversation. We have so many other questions in the chat, but unfortunately our time has come to an end. I wish we could have a part two, but um, I know that you all are definitely open to um, individuals reaching out to you if they have more questions. And so your information is all available to everybody through our agenda. And so please, if you had questions that you wanted answered but didn't get an opportunity to, reach out to these individuals and they'll be happy to talk to you about their services. Thank you all so much for being here and providing this information for us. And we appreciate um, your time. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate this session. Melanie's making a stop, but <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. We go on and on. Um, just want to remind everyone that our next and last session of the conference um, will be a great uh, session about transportation. We have some national speakers from uh, the U.S. Department of Labor um, and also some regional people from um, New Orleans that will be speaking. So uh, it's a big, great session. Y'all stay tuned. Thank you.